Hi, I'm Ahmed Shabuddin, filling in for Femi Ok and Jor in the stream. Today in Canada, two attacks in three days against Canadian soldiers caught the country by surprise. But it's how the government plans to respond that has sparked an intense debate. Of course, I'm joined by Malika Bilal, our digital producer, who has all your live feedback and is going to be looking out for what comes in during the show. Malika, yeah, right. I know this is going to be a heated show. Obviously, this conversation, you know, how much should we be willing to trade in our privacy mm -hmm. for security mm -hmm. is something that's, you know, long been a topic of conversation here in the U.S., but right. increasingly in Canada, it seems. Exactly. And it makes for a vibrant discussion online. So one of the questions that's on many people's minds that I'm seeing in our community is, will Canada change after these mm -hmm. attacks? And we got one opinion. This is from Ottawa. Um, Diola tweets in, most definitely. This week has felt completely different with more thorough ID checks around the hill where the attacks took place. So that's one view. We want yours as well during today's show. Tweet us your questions and your comments with hashtag AJStream. I'm Simon Ray, Country Director for Mind Advisory Group in Laos, and I'm in the stream. One person has been shot in our nation's capital at the war memorial. You can't be like anyway. Everybody was just in shock. Uh, couldn't believe that something like this uh, could just happen or be real. Now that was the scene in Ottawa last week when a gunman shot and murdered a Canadian soldier at the National War Memorial before entering Parliament where he was then killed by police. Just three days before that, a driver intentionally ran over two soldiers near Montreal. He was later shot by police following a high-speed car chase. Now, the two attacks, described by Prime Minister Stephen Harper as ISIL-inspired, came less than three weeks after his government agreed to join the U.S.-led airstrikes against ISIL. And while the attacks caught many by surprise, they also triggered a heated debate around how the government should respond. So far, legislators have tabled a bill that would expand the powers of the Canadian Security Intelligence Services, or CSIS, that's Canada's spy agency. But with talk of more anti-terror measures to come, critics worry that the price for security will mean less privacy and freedom for ordinary Canadians. Now joining us to talk about this, we have Benjamin Scheinwald, a former public servant, Harsha Walia, a social justice activist and journalist, Scott Gilmore, a columnist at McLean's Magazine and former diplomat, and last but not least, Christine Duhame, a lawyer specializing in counter-terror financing practice. Welcome to you all. Christine, I'm going to start with you. You know, we keep hearing about this perception that exists in Canada and perhaps of Canada that it's safe, that it's a peaceful country. Uh, were you surprised by these attacks? Do you feel less safe? Uh, I certainly feel less safe, but not as a result of the attacks. Um, I've been following ISIL's YouTube and Twitter accounts and, and what they publish on in their magazine. And what they have said is that there are attacks coming to Canada from them. And the two attacks that we've had have not necessarily been directly from them. So there are attacks coming, so they say, and they've kept to their word thus far and everything they've promised. And so if that's true, then there are attacks directly from them coming to Canada in some way, shape or form. So I am less safe in Canada as a result of the things they publish, uh, not necessarily as a result of Ottawa. Is it palpable for you? You know, I want to ask you, Scott, as well, you know, this 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 thing that we keep hearing about, you know, Canada and its its reputation. Is there something about Canada's social fabric, uh, perhaps, that sets it apart from other countries in your mind in terms of, you know, how willing perhaps citizens or the government even will be in terms of, you know, this knee jerk reaction to kind of beefing up security and whatnot? No, absolutely. You know, Canada is defined uh, in terms of, of how we look at ourselves and how the world looks at us as an open society. And I live in Ottawa. In fact, the attack took place a few blocks from my children's school where they were locked down for the day. And I would actually have to disagree with uh, some of your commenters. I feel that uh, the reaction here has been admirable, that uh, life has carried on, that people have recognized that this was a lone attack and that when you step back and you take a look at it, you know, more people died from spider bites in Canada over the last year than from terrorist attacks. And so I, I think people are, uh, are putting this in perspective. Benjamin, you agree with Scott there? 
Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I do think that uh, Canada is defined by its openness, but I also think that uh, Canadians in general have been very complacent with respect to security. You know, it, it may be that more Canadians have died uh, from spider bites over the course of a given period than from terrorism. It doesn't mean that the risk from terrorism or other uh, other, other 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 dangers uh, is not is not real. I think we do face some real dangers. I think we have faced dangers for a while. We've been on borrowed time, uh, and I think that it's high time that Canadians uh, woke up to some of these threats. And without going overboard and within the bounds of reason, uh, adjusted our political culture uh, to enable uh, ourselves to be secure, our, parliamentar our parliamentarians to be secure, and our public servants to be secure. You know, Harsha, I, I want to uh, read something to you that I've seen online floating around. And this is the idea of Canada being an innocent place. So there's a notion that Canada has lost its innocence after these attacks. So look at this tweet. This is from David, who says, Canadian involvement in Iraq, invasion of Afghanistan, not so innocent. That's the hashtag he uses to push against this idea of lost innocence. There's also a video comment here on that same topic. So Harsha, have a listen to this. After the attack, there's a lot of talk about Canada losing its innocence. First of all, we were never innocent. We've been through a lot as a country and have only come out of those tragedies stronger and more together. But what may have been confused for innocence were our values, peace, justice, inclusion, equality. And that's what's going to help us get through this tragedy. There's a risk that we could lose those values, but we can't. So Harsha, he talks about losing those values. Do you think that that is something that's in danger of happening? Yeah, I mean, I'd have to agree with the, the person who you tweeted, which is, you know, we really have to push back against this idea of Canada's loss of innocence, because depending on who we speak to, Canada has not been innocent, right? If you talk to the thousands and thousands of indigenous people who continue to live under settler colonialism, there's no innocence. If you continue to talk to people in northern Iraq and Palestine and Haiti who have been subjected to Canadian foreign policy, Canada has not been innocent. And so I think this, this notion of Canada as being innocent is one that's really ideological. Um, I do think that, you know, there are a fair number of people who have been reasonable in the context of the Ottawa shooting, but I do think that overwhelmingly we've had this swing to the right, this really hyperbolic, over-exaggerated response um, that this is Canada's 9-11, if you will. And this is this is not Canada's 9-11. Um, this was, as one of your guests mentioned, like a, a, it was a lone attack. And just to put into perspective, a few months ago, you know, Justin Bork um, stopped the RCMP. He murdered three officers. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that was that was never cast as a terrorist attack. Right. So we know that what gets cast as terrorism is hugely ideological. Um, and in the context of the war on terror, when Stephen Harper wants to continue to send troops to northern Iraq to fight ISIL, right. when there's this constant construction of an imminent threat, whether it's al-Qaeda or ISIL, fair or enough, you fair know, enough, some, fair some enough. foreign threat, fair enough, that's Harsha. what happens. Fair enough, fair enough. But Benjamin, I mean, there was a security problem here. I mean, he just walked in. If you take a look at this footage, this is some of the surveillance fo footage. You can see him right there walking in. Uh, and, yep. you know, there were reports of up to 50 shots uh, fired inside Parliament. It's pretty unbelievable that he was just able to, to shoot someone, drive to Parliament, walking with a rifle. Uh, where was the security? Yeah, I mean, that is my core point to make today on this on this show. Uh, I spent three years living in Ottawa and barely a day went by working in the very spots where in Parliament where you see that footage and in the Prime Minister's office, and the Privy Council office right across the street from where the footage is taken. And barely a day went by where I didn't shake my head and wonder why nobody had the same concerns uh, that I had, that I'd been sensitized from experiences in other countries yeah. and other parts of the world. Um, you know, no, I, 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 I have to. Yeah, go ahead, disagree. Scott. I have to disagree with Benjamin here and with you actually on that point about what went wrong. I mean, let's take a look at this. A man runs into Parliament and within the course of less than a minute and a half, 27 bullets are put into his body. From what I can tell, that was a pretty effective security response. And but actually, so, Scott, you know, if, you, if you hear, if you, if you hear a, a social democratic MP from the NDP in Canada named Charlie Angus, 
a bunch of MPs were actually whisked out of the center block of parliament, the building you see right now, uh, sorry, that's the east block, the building you see right now uh, in, a, in a moment on the screen, they were pushed outside for their own safety, uh, where, mm -hmm. and, and then they, were, they weren't giving any instructions, they were sent to an adjacent building where they weren't allowed to enter, and had this not been a, a lone uh, a shooter, had it been a properly orchestrated, if I can put it that way, terrorist attack yeah. with second shooters outside, they would have been going right into right. a blind, right, in, right into, the right into the a, a catchment area. Second shooters. We're always scared of the second shooter, but we never see it. You know what, Benjamin, you're absolutely right. It could have been You're saying worse. there's never it a second shooter in terrorist attacks? It could have been a T-Rex. I mean, we have to draw a line and recognize that there is limits to what we can protect ourselves against. The lone wolf shooter, it happens. We can't do anything about it. You know, yeah. when Parliament was actually designed in the 1850s, there was the original plan was to make it crenellated to look like a castle. And it was explicitly stated that that is not the appropriate uh, seat of power for an open free society like Canada. So let's keep those walls down. Let's let it open. Let's risk another attack because so, so let me ask we you. are an open field. So, to well. so should we reduce security? I mean, should we just say there's no longer any firearms allowed on the Hill, at least by uh, by police officers, CSIS officials, military, and so forth? Well, Benjamin, we that's that, an interesting you know, question that you're asking. It's been an interesting point. About. And Christine, I hear you. I want to pick up on something that Scott said, though, uh, uh, risking another attack. Because online, you have people who hear that and they say, like this tweet from Hassan, who says, Canadians need to wake up to these threats. We need to be more here, secure here. because clearly we are not. Another tweet from Vesper who says, I think security needs to be tightened. It needs to be streamlined. But I'm queasy at anything that gives Prime Minister Stephen Harper more power. Christine? Um, well, I think what I hear from police forces is that Canada is really, it's not it, the innocence uh, issue, I guess, is that we are really complacent. We actually don't think there will be significant terrorist attacks here. I think that there will be, and I think that we need to take more security measures to protect ourselves. I mean, like, you know, these threats are real, and I don't think anyone should go through any more harm or we should have you know, any... I think you know, our guests are, are confusing the word threat and the, and the word risk. Um, I used to be in counterterrorism in my role as a diplomat, and there is a big, big difference between there being threats and there being an actual risk. I'm talking about threats, but we, you we know, face threats, but we don't face a risk. So we simply don't. If you take a look at the number of North Americans that have died, actually, let's make it the number of Western Europeans and North Americans that who have died from terror attacks in the last decade. It is minuscule compared to the number so, of so other uh, deaths from other other sources. So you want to save Canadians, make them. Yeah, I think kids. we. That's, a, that's, a, that's a fair with, point, I Scott. I agree with what Scott. Harsha, go ahead. Go ahead. Especially for especially if we're going to look at, you know, if this if this threat gets constructed as a terrorist attack versus again, you know, the lone shooting, the lone wolf that it was, then it's really important to know that this Conservative government has also scrapped the the long gun registry, right? So if we want to talk about yeah. how to keep people safe and secure. Then we look at we have to look at the changes in, in gun control legislation. That's a core but, issue. But you know, so, so when we talk when we when we talk, I about don't think it's a minor point. I want to finish. I don't think it's a minor point that Scott is making, which is that the number of deaths by so-called terrorist attacks is minuscule. You know, police, more people have died in Canada this year from police violence. There's been over a dozen people who've been shot by the police, right? What about their security? What yeah, about the security I, of two thousand missing and murdered Indigenous women? There's been eighty thousand people under the Harper government who've been incarcerated without charge under the guise of war on terror. What about their security? So Harsha, you're bringing up, Harsha, you're bringing up some great points. Scott, I see you are agreeing with Harsha and it's worth pointing out, <laughs> well, I don't know if our audience- I, I, I agree with half of what Harsha says and the half of well, what I raised my yeah, I, 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 I'll let you. I'll let you <laughs> clarify Scott. that, but you also were kind of uh, laughing, if I, if I can point this out to our yeah. audience. When Malika l read this tweet uh, from Asan Omar saying, Canadians need to wake up to these threats. We need to be more secure because clearly we are not uh, you know, obviously the laugh, I think, uh, I don't know what it, what triggered it. Is it just that you think being more secure is the wrong approach or? No, because, uh, you know, today in preparation for your show, I actually took a look at some actuarial tables. These are the tables that insurers use to take a look at how likely you are to die from different threats, from whether it's heart disease or terrorism. And when you look at it, you realize that objectively, Canada is one of the safest places on the planet. Our security works. This is the most uh, peaceful country, honest to God, in the world. And so to say that we're, that it's not that, that we have security problems, that we're failing our security, that's simply wrong. Yeah, well, you know, Scott, one thing that we were discussing is whether things should be more secure. We're talking about different proposals. Uh, you know, we heard about proposals for gun control, but focusing on uh, the proposed legislation that would be amended by the Canadian Security Intelligence Services Act, I just want to give a quick summary for our audience, and then maybe we can discuss this. It would be more powers of surveillance, quote, to more effectively investigate threats to the security of Canada, 
uh, give Canada's spy agency explicit authority to operate, quote, within or outside Canada, and last but not least, give greater protection to confidential sources without having to identify them in court proceedings, even to the judge. And of course, there would be more to come uh, in the follow-up. Uh, Harsha, what about those proposals is, is most concerning to you? I mean, I think overall these proposals are, are deeply troubling. They're, you know, many would argue that they're unconstitutional. The introduction of secret evidence is essentially introducing hearsay. It goes against the presumption of innocence. Uh, it goes against the fact that people have a right to see the evidence against them. I do want to highlight that Canada actually already allows for that under the security certificate legislation. Um, people who are non-Canadians, who are permanent residents, who are refugees, are faced with secret trials, essentially, this really Orwellian secret trial um, process and also you know the five eyes network that Canada is a part of along with other Western countries that allows for Canada to spy on its own citizens that allows Canada to refuse um, you know it, and it's spying on Canadians who are fighting abroad this is also it's so, really selective so, you know, so, because Canada no I do want to mention one thing one thing that's really important to highlight is Canada does nothing absolutely does nothing about the 145 lone soldiers who are Canadian who fight for the IDF right they are not surveillance Canada has no problem with Canadian citizens going to fight for the Israeli Defense Forces yeah so uh, the way Christine, no, Christine uh, network, Harsha yeah. please Harsha this let's really hear from selective. Harsha uh, you're bringing up some great points but I think Christine's disagreeing with some of them yeah, those are great points. Um, I agree with some of it, but you know, I happen to be a fan of Bill C-44. I think that whatever we can do to get the information we need to protect Canadians, to protect Canada, to make sure that uh, a situation that's happening in Syria does not take root here and affect us, I'm I'm in favor of as a Canadian, and I recognize the you know the inconsistency with a lawyer uh, saying that you know let's infringe some of our human some of our civil rights for this legislation but on the other hand at the end of the day I would rather continue to live in a democracy where the rule of law prevails than have a, an organization like the Islamic State take greater root in Canada well Benjamin yeah, you know here, I want to go to no. you there uh, because you heard what Christine fearful, said about right? being so a lawyer fearful. Benjamin you yeah. were a public servant and so I want your thoughts yeah. on this as well and and whether you think there's overreach here uh, based on these tweets Samir says the Canadian spy agency CSIS already CSIS. monitors people overseas as the government said this week we need robust oversight of it you do have a little pushback though online kyle says what serious country would not look abroad to protect its citizens saying that that's needed are you at all worried about uh, there not being enough oversight on what the spy agency is doing yeah absolutely well first of all i guess i'm a twofer for you because i'm a former public servant but i'm also a lawyer as well Look, the the issue of uh, of of uh, bringing in sensitive uh, evidence into court under under secrecy is a is a very challenging one, and it's it, mm -hmm. it cuts to the heart of these very difficult tensions in free and democratic society between the need for security and and the need for openness and and fairness to defendants for sure. My understanding of the CSIS legislation is is limited, but I do think, um, uh, like Christine, uh, that in, in general, I, I think, if I heard you correctly, Christine, these are sort of modest uh, changes. Some of them are clarifications. And you take, for example, the, the idea of CSIS, as we call it here in Canada, having overseas activities, which I think is a clarification, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Like, for heaven's sakes, we live in a globalized world. Uh, everything is globalized. I'm, I'm sitting right now in Winnipeg, Scott's in, uh, in Ottawa. You guys are in Washington, D.C. People are watching all over the world. Why of all organizations should our, our spy and our intelligence agencies be restricted to operating in Canada? And you know, I'll add as well, I'm, I'm visiting family here in Winnipeg. I live in Toronto. I went through a security check to get on a totally innocuous commercial flight from Toronto to Winnipeg. I'm going to get on one again tomorrow and return to Toronto. Why is it that on this totally innocuous flight I have to go through security, through x-ray, through uh, pat down perhaps, I didn't have one myself, but through uh, the various uh, technologies, show my ID multiple times to get on this flight, but for right. Parliament, the centre of our country, you can just walk in with a shotgun and tell somebody. And, uh, and, well, somebody you know, and Benjamin, really and Benjamin, Benjamin, brought that up. Benjamin Scott, Scott, will come, because, Scott will come right back to you. I just want to, because he's bringing up all these points, you know, one of the major criticisms just broadly is that the government is actually using this as a pretext. You know, the government's taking advantage of this. And I, I, so there's no way. Well, Benjamin, yeah. Benjamin, let's let's actually just listen to what yeah. Prime Minister Harper sure. had to say himself. And then we'll come sure. right back to you, Scott, and we'll, we'll continue the discussion. Take a look, sure. look. This is what he said on the same day as the attack. But this week's events are a grim reminder that Canada is not immune to the types of terrorist attacks we have seen elsewhere around the world. Attacks on our security personnel 
and on our institutions of governance are by their very nature attacks on our country. But let there be no misunderstanding. We will not be intimidated. Canada will never be intimidated. In fact, this will lead us to strengthen our resolve and redouble our efforts and those of our national security agencies to take all necessary steps to identify and counter threats and keep Canada safe here at home. And you know, Scott, some people are suggesting that these calls to expand surveillance and some of the other reforms or amendments in the legislation are just going to put in public what is already happening behind closed doors. I mean, what do you make of what Harper said just there? Well, you know, I, I, I want to go back to what Benjamin said first. Um, he, he quite rightly compared the security he faces on getting on a domestic flight to Winnipeg, the security that I as a citizen would face going into Parliament and showing that how disproportionate they are. And that's because, let's be honest, the, the security that we face at our airports, it's theater. It was put in place because there was a tremendous amount of pressure on our parliamentarians and our politicians in the United States and Europe to react to the 9-11 attacks. Right. And they haven't made us safer, they've just made us more inconvenienced. And so when you take a look at what Prime Minister Harper's doing, it's exactly what we would expect. There's a lot of emotion, there's a lot of pressure, he needs to do something that's coming from externally, but also internally, his civil servants and his police, they want added powers, they want more money, they always do, there's no end to it. And unfortunately, there is an accretion of this, and we've seen this in the United States with the militarization of the right, police. Right. The, the NSA, it adds up, adds up, adds up until one day you wake up like America has right now and they look around and they don't recognize and, the country. And, 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 there, avoid that and, and there are questions, of course, about the efficacy of, you know, broadening surveillance and whatnot. I mean, on a personal level, you know, I travel through, through airports all the time for work. And, you know, recently when I've been coming to the <laughs> U.S., I get detained, you know, five out of eight times. And it does seem arbitrary. There's no right. real explanation. But I know that Malika has a lot of interesting comments coming from our community. Malika, what mm -hmm. are they saying? Well, you know, on the back of the comments that you played from Stephen Harper, there are people online saying, we're focusing on the wrong thing. And Harsha, this is a point yep. that came up in our discussion, but I want to read you this tweet from James. He says, the attack appears to be the action of one guy spurred by his own ideology. Canada should do what we do, and they shouldn't react to one event. There's also a video comment from someone who says something similar. Have a listen. We're too quick to jump on the label of terrorist and not look at the specifics of the people involved. Um, with the Ottawa shooter and with many other recent acts, uh, they really follow a pattern that should be familiar to Americans with the sort of uh, troubled individual who has a history of mental health and who takes a larger ideology, whether it's uh, you know, white supremacist thinking or uh, misogyny, um, uh, to sort of give meaning and rationality to their lives. So Harsha, he goes on to say that what needs to yeah. be focused on is mental health. Now we're running out of time here, but in about a sentence or two, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, I would agree with both those commentators and what Jeet said in particular. One of the things that is particularly troubling about what, about Stephen Harper's comments and also this discussion is that it presupposes that this attack is not only a terrorist attack, but that it's something that had somehow something to do with ISIS or ISIL, which you know all media reports and even the RCMP have had to backtrack on that this probably isn't the case. That this is the this is a lone attack. It has to do with one individual who likely has mental health issues. We know that Michael um, lived in homeless shelters, lived on the streets, lived in Vancouver's downtown east side where I worked um, and where I continue to work and I'm you know I'm also trained as a lawyer um, and I see this all the time where people who are suffering from mental health are increasingly suffering from mental health cuts in our system mm -hmm. um, people are put through that are you know are going through the revolving door of homeless no. shelters and are increasingly Parts suffering are, from mental know, health and addiction think, barriers you know that what? are not being Parts supported and so if we want if we want to talk about if we want to talk about putting money into something, why don't we put money into human security? Why don't we put money into addiction services, into mental health services, into looking it, it at how people in our communities will actually be safe? Right. It does. Seem know, this, go ahead. This very goes, quickly. This, just this one goes, sentence. Okay. This this goes to a, a debate going on right now as to whether this was terrorism, murder, or mental health, or something else. At some you know level, what? You know what? You know what? I'm actually I'm going to stop you right there because you brought up a very interesting point. You know, are we allocating resources properly? Are we giving enough attention to the media to different issues? So it's a good place to to kind of put the discussion on hold. We'll pick it up with all of our guests in the online post show. That's going to be at stream.aljazeera.com. On Monday, Femi will be back. She'll be looking at the topic of spanking children. Does it actually discipline them? Is it just inflicting emotional and physical pain? Stay with us. The post show is next at stream.aljazeera.com. We'll see you online.
This is the Stream's online post show. We've been talking about the recent attacks against Canadian soldiers in Canada and their impact on the country's future. We're going to get right back to it. Uh, you know, Harsha, you brought up some interesting points about if we're focusing on the right things. Oftentimes, it seems as though the media does focus a little too much on terrorism. There is fear mongering that comes from politicians at times. And Scott, I know you were picking up the conversation there, so yeah. we'll come right back to you. Or Benjamin, go ahead, either one. Well, I was Go just going to add to to, uh, to Harsh's point that you know this this mentally disturbed man claimed that he was supporting ISIL and shot up Parliament. If he had claimed he was from outer space, would we be having a show right now? We'd be talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think so. I think we have. It, it, I'm not saying that mental health and terrorism don't overlap, but right. we have to put some in context. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because while you say that, uh, we had looked, uh, before we kind of came into the discussion, uh, there were a lot of comments on this already on Twitter, people kind of venting, and, and Verinder Bular is one of them. He says in Canada, uh, more lives are lost because of mental illness and drug yeah. addiction than yeah. terrorism. Prime Minister, please set your priorities right. Now, the reason I read that is, you know, we heard, he's kind of echoing what Harsha was already saying, but when we talk about setting priorities, I mean, Benjamin, do you not think that perhaps that is uh, a big part of this discussion and part of the discussion that we should be ha having. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do think that at some level, and not totally, but at some level, it doesn't matter whether it was terrorism, murder, mental illness, or something else. What matters is keeping our national institutions, our parliamentarians, our leaders, and our public servants secure. And I think, you know, as a former public servant, if, if I was still a public servant today, the question I'd have for my co-panelists and, and for my hosts would be, why is my blood so cheap? Uh, you know, uh, uh, every organization in Ontario to has to, every, to every, every, every organization Harsha, Harsha, in Ontario, every organization in Ontario, big or small, like five employees minimum, has to go through an annual security review with their staff. I'm going to do mine in my private bu private business in the next few days. Why should we discount the one place where we have our, our holy of holies, our parliament, to say, you know what? We're going to open open it up totally and, and open up to risk. If my house is burgled, I don't go no. and take the, the lock off the door. I add a second one or put on a security alarm or buy a dog or something like that. Well, Why the, is it the, the parliamentarians and public servants are so, belong, are so dispensable? The difference is that Parliament Hill doesn't belong to you as a civil servant, which is a mistake that I think is often made amongst our, our, our civil yeah. servants. Parliament Hill belongs but, to me. It belongs to other right, Canadians. But, but, par an but parliamentarians and public and servants are the... But parliamentarians guess, and public I servants are I the one who are, ones who are there day in, day out. They face the higher risk. You know, I'll take my, my two girls there one day and we'll do an Ottawa tour and we'll see Parliament and it'll be wonderful. And I'll go, it'll be a once or twice in a lifetime trip when my kids are at the right age. But when, when I was working there, I was there once a week and I was there infrequently. And I deserve better security than saying, you know what, uh, we should reallocate a, 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 some, uh, some fairly minor resources, I'm quite sure, uh, to, to social programs and such, which I don't think will, will uh, in the end, uh, reduce the risk that, that parliamentarians and public servants face. Well, Harsha, I, I know that you want to get in here, but our community yeah. does as well. So I just I want to I want to read something yeah. for you. I'll direct this to you. Um, this is from Lindsay, and this is a view that I've seen across platforms. So this is on Facebook. She says measures should be taken to prevent this from happening again. However, I fear the government's reaction will be rash. A big part of the problem is Stephen Harper's rhetoric and tendency towards racial profiling. So uh, specifically looking at that racial profiling and the rhetoric that she says that's problematic. What what do you see among average everyday Canadians and what do you think their reaction has been? Yeah, I, I'll answer that. I do want to just jump in and say that, you know, this emphasis on keeping parliamentarians safe and public servants safe, you know, that's important. But within that, again, we're losing the fact about who is actually tangibly, concretely, not just, you know, fearing or potentially facing the risk of, of violence in Canada, but who is actually facing risk of violence in Canada in terms of concrete terms. You know, we have 2,000 missing and murdered Indigenous women. Why are their lives not factored into a conversation about security? We can't define security in such a narrow Back way that it's self-perpetuating, right? So those those 2,000 women, that, that doesn't need minor resources. That needs major resources. And in terms of, you know, racial profiling, absolutely. I mean, this, this constant conflation of the Ottawa attacks with with ISIS, with ISIL, and particularly with, with Islam, um, is something that's troubling. Because again, if we look well, at a number of other well, incidents of violence that have happened in Canada, again, you know, the incident involving Justin Bork, none of those were racialized in the same way. None of them were, were cast that's, as... That's a, that, um, that's a great point, Harsha. That's a great point. And before we move on, I just want to kind of bring up something. When we're talking about racism, obviously it's hard to measure it, obviously during times when this is on the kind of public uh, you know, consciousness, we see 
um, racism be discussed, but oftentimes it's not discussed. Now, a couple of guys got together. I'm sure you may have seen this video. It garnered over 1.3 million views in just three days, uh, which was essentially an attempt to test whether Canadians feel safe in the presence of Muslims. Um, let's take a quick look at the beginning of the video, and then we'll come right back to you. That's great. You know, are you planning on taking the bus? Yeah. Um, I, I'd suggest that you take another ride then. Why? Um, well, look at how he's dressed. So what? So you know what? You can't stereotype and judge people by their clothes or their well, nationality or anything else. You know what I mean? What happened there? It was an incident of, of fanatics. I do understand. Everybody but cannot be punished like that. They did that in the states. 9/11. It was crazy. So I mean, I'm sorry, but are, this are is a friend of mine. I'm with him too. I, you see that this is a friend of mine, I'm with him too. So, you know, that kind of, uh, I see you're, you're nodding Benjamin and smiling, but yeah. you know, of that course, awesome. of course it, it is awesome, but it should be mentioned yeah. that later on in the video, you know, the guy yeah. who was posing as the Islamophobe, essentially, who was harassing the guy right. who was, you know, dressed, uh, you know, in traditional uh, garb, seemed to uh, be surprised when another guy was so upset, he went and punched him in the face. And, you know, that yeah. just, I think, highlights yeah how visceral this is for people, even people who aren't, you know, necessarily directly affected, just passers-by in the street. Uh, what do you make of that video? And more importantly, what do you think it suggests about where Canada is, perhaps as compared with the U.S.? Yeah, I, you know, I still truly believe that Canadians are, are a very tolerant people. We're not perfect, and I think we have this inflated self-image sometimes, partly that we're, that we're innocent, to go back to the earlier part of the conversation, and partly uh, that uh, we're Boy Scouts. Uh, we, have our, we have our fanatics. One of them, mentally ill or not, attacked our parliament last week. Another one of them attacked a soldier in Quebec a, few day, a couple days earlier. Uh, but, you know, for me, the, the, the telling incident of the week was in a town of Cold Lake, Alberta, a military town in northern Alberta, really remote. I was there once years ago, where the local mosque was defaced terribly. And the photos, and you can find them online, of the community coming together and say the, the graffiti said you know go home or something like that and the community came together and said this is your home you you are at home in canada and to my mind that's the wonderful thing if there is a wonderful thing coming out of these attacks you know benjamin i'm glad you noted you noted that and pulled it up on my screen here we actually did a web piece on it on you can find it stream.aljazeera.com here's cold lake mosque where you can see in graffiti go home canada and then community members muslim and non-muslims alike came out to say you are home and they put up messages of support here, here. and really rallied around so that really brings me to my next point and scott i'll direct this to you you wrote a piece uh, entitled, I'm reading this, why the best response to the Ottawa shootings is to open Parliament to all Canadians. And so on that right. point, I pulled up this tweet. Um, this is something that was floating around after the attacks. This is Eric tweets this. In case the world is wondering, this is more what we're used to seeing on Parliament Hill. Uh, he uses hashtag Ottawa shooting, but he shows uh, yoga yeah. participants on uh, the Hill. What's been the reaction to your piece? Has it been people saying that this is the true face of Canada? and this is how open it should be? Yeah. You know, I, I wrote that piece because I was expecting that there was going to be a visceral response of bring out more guns, uh, round up the suspects, and it's been the opposite, actually. You know, when after the, the 2011 attacks in Norway, the uh, Jan Eglund, who was a Norwegian politician, responded by saying, the whole point of terror is to create shock and fear and to get us to leave our liberal values, to lure us over to the shadowy side of the playing field. We should not let them win. And that's how Canadians have reacted. They, have, they, they immediately wanted the Honour Guard returned to the War Memorial. For the most part, uh, they've wanted Parliament to remain open, a place where we can do yoga on sunny days. And I think, you know, when, when uh, Benjamin points to how proud he is of those Canadians who went to that mosque and scrubbed it, he should trust those Canadians. Right. Trust them to keep our country open, trust our democracy, trust our freedoms, and Canada will be strong and free. You know, Scott, one thing that we maybe didn't have in enough time to discuss is the notion of fear, how it manifests itself. To your point, not just in politics, but in policy, we've seen it. Uh, we've heard, you know, some of the guests reference it in terms of in the U.S. Uh, and there are fears that Canada might be militarizing like the U.S. It seems, though, that at the very least we've had a fruitful discussion. We've moved things a little bit forward. Uh, and you know what's most interesting is Benjamin, obviously we can't continue the conversation, but the conversation at the stream always does continue. And you told our producers that Canada needs to have a national conversation when it comes to security yeah. and yeah. privacy, yeah. much like the one we just had. And you asked our producers, why aren't the Canadian media calling you like Al Jazeera or international media is calling you? So, yeah, yeah. so an, yeah. interest, an interesting yeah, yeah. point on that. 
point alone. And I do want to thank you all for joining. Uh, on the next AJ stream, which will be on Monday, Femi will be back to look at the topic of spanking children. Does it actually discipline them? Is it just inflicting emotional and physical pain? Until then, we will see you online.